Thanks, Megan, and good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning to Bethany. It's good to be here within the walls and also online for those of you who are with us that way. We begin a new series called Building Hope. It's uh, based on the book of 1 Peter that we'll be uh, walking through together over the next few weeks. Uh, This morning, I'd like to just open our whole series with a moment of prayer, so let's do that together. Father, thank you that we have the privilege of gathering within these walls and also online to listen for your voice, and we would confess that uh, the history of your people and the history of the church is filled with moments when we amassed a great deal of information, but that information didn't translate into transformation. And at this moment in history, we come to you expressing our desire uh, to be people of hope in this city and light, and justice, and generosity, and celebration, and hospitality. And we believe that uh, you can do that. So we ask for not only ears to hear, but hearts to respond, to give us next steps to take. And we'll thank you. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, I pride myself on trying to always share stories and illustrations with whom everyone can relate But this morning, I'm opening with a sermon illustration that not all of you will understand. So I apologize in advance. And I'm going to help those of you who don't understand by asking for an honest, there's a sharing question. Who hasn't read the Chronicles of Narnia? Raise your hands. Well, if you haven't, look around at the hands not raised. They will help you understand the opening illustration, all right? So that's how we're going to do this. Because what I'm going to do is something evangelicals are not supposed to do. You're not supposed to, you know argue about the deity of Christ or the beauty and inerrancy of the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, but I'm going to do the latter of those this morning and, and just say my, I mean, I love those books and I watched the, the movie version, the Voyage, Voyage of the Dawn Treader uh, Friday on a flight home from the East Coast and it's so moving and I was crying and my seatmate thought I was ill or something like that. But... Uh, my complaint is that the Chronicles are too binary. In other words, you go through the wardrobe, which is, is England, and then you enter a new world. And you're in the world, and you do things, and you meet beavers and witches and lions and stuff, and then uh, there's a whole Eastern atonement theory presented to you, <laughs> and then you come back out, and you're back in England. And then if you want to go back, you got to go back through the wardrobe. And then you come back, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. And here's the deal, that's not the way it works. Uh, It's not like we have this world, and then someday you'll die, and you go to the other world. That's just uh, not true. The other world is already here now. And so we don't go through the wardrobe. Uh, what, What it falls to us to do is to learn how to live in both of these worlds at the same time. And First Peter is really written toward that end because Christians are suddenly suffering in, you know, horrific, dramatic, visible ways. Many scholars believe that Peter was writing during the time of Nero, and uh, Nero had it in for Christians over, uh, you know, narcissism and lust of power and all that stuff. And so... The, it was, they were persecuted. By persecuted, I don't mean you can't pray at school. That's not persecution, right? This was Christians arrested, uh, thrown to lions, torn to bits, you know, literally tortured, pulled apart, physically pulled apart of four pieces. Some uh, used as torches for Nero's parties. So, you've, you know, here you are, you've come to Christ, this beautiful transcendent message, this gospel of hope, and then the bottom drops out of your world and you're now in hiding and scattered and suffering and you've got friends who've lost their lives, friends in jail, friends literally torn to pieces by lions and you, and you go, hope? Really? How do I live as a person of hope when this is the reality? So it's really an appropriate book because um, when things aren't working as you thought they would, it's vital to ask the question, how do I live as a person of hope in this moment? And hello, things aren't working. And if you don't believe that, I don't know what planet you live on, right? Not working economically, not working socially, socially not working with respect to race, not working with respect to uh, homelessness 
or addiction or mental illness or loneliness or depression or poverty. Not working. And, and uh, Christians aren't being, you know, thrown to lions, but we're viewed as completely irrelevant by that car just driving by right now. Probably, right? At best, irrelevant. At worst, uh, the source of all ails in our culture. So how do we live as people of hope here and now? It starts by understanding that there's two realities, right? There's, there's this world and there's this heavenly reality that is also here. And we have to find a way to allow this heavenly reality to like so saturate us that it informs how we live in this world. And that's what the book of 1 Peter is about. So that's kind of what we're going to do over the next few weeks. Uh, and, and this morning, I really want to frame it by talking about these realities, the reality of a living hope and the reality of suffering. And then with this th- kind of thesis statement, bo- hey, both realities are here. Which one's going to prevail in the way that you live your life? So let's go through this together, starting with reality of a living hope. So you have a Bible, uh, 1 Peter 1. If you don't, no worries. Just listen and I'll read. And this is what we read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So, a living hope through the resurrection of Christ. That's kind of the thesis here. We can be people of hope because of the resurrection. And the result of this is uh, we, we receive this inheritance here Verse four, this inheritance, which is what? Imperishable. Which means there's this kind of incorruptible reality in the midst of a world filled with corruption and decay, right? So there's this thing that we now have in Christ that is real, and not just real, but beautiful, and not just real and beautiful, but real and beautiful and eternal and incorruptible. And Paul is saying, let's open this letter about horrific suffering, not with, oh, have you read the news this morning? Another shooting, you know, no gun laws, homelessness, addiction, politics. Stop. <laughs> like, let's try a different starting point is what Peter is saying here because he's right to people who are suffering. And the first words are, hey, let's give thanks because A, we have a living hope. The living hope is confirmed through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And because of this, we have not only a hope, but an inheritance. And this inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and will never fade away, ever. So really good news is the starting point, the reality of a living hope and incorruptible inheritance. And so I want to challenge us to like believe by faith that this hope is here now, right? Uh, you see it somewhat in nature. How do I know that? Psalm 19, Romans 1, Romans 10, Psalm 104, they all say the same thing. Uh, this created world is a relation of the character of God, right? And so, you know, we look around at the world, and what do we see? We see kind of the beauty of interdependency, in, in creation, and so I spoke of this a few weeks ago, but the trees are feeding us, we're feeding the trees, the animals are feeding the soil, the soil is feeding the trees, and the trees are, you know, sheltering the animals, and, you know, we're, we're caring for the animals, and then we're eating the animals, unless you're a vegetarian, but uh, that's okay, because we get eaten in the end, too, and we return to soil, which then feeds the trees. So, there we go. It's this beautiful system of in, in beauty and interdependency and shalom, and, and in this, uh, we read, you know, Colossians 1.17, Acts 17.28, Colossians 3.11, that, you know, shot through all of it is the, the sustaining and life-imparting glory of Christ. Christ is like all and in all, Colossians 3.11, Acts 17, in him Christ, we, Paul speaking to pagans, you know, unsaved, in him we... That's all of us in the room. We live and move and have our being. Everybody. In Christ. So just take a, take a moment here and just look at somebody in the room, you know, make eye contact, and, you go, and you're like this. Guess what? 
Christ is the be- all the beauty of Christ is in you. And by the way, me. And you. And me. And you. And you. So, and then look around outside. Oh, Christ is sustaining all of this. Those trees are, are sustained by Christ. The soil is sustained by Christ. It's all Christ. So we can't, if we start there, we're like, okay, all of that has nothing to do with who wins the midterms. None. <laughs> or or uh, August inflation numbers. Or your uh, 401k, th- that number, which is bad. I'm sorry. So, okay, sorry, that's the way it is. But none of those things, or China, or Ukraine, or Putin, or the guy in Hungary, none of it changes these realities. None of it. Christ is sustaining everything. I mean, we have a tree in our backyard because we live in the past that's, we think, about 250 years old. So think about 250 years. You know, Revolutionary War, Civil War, uh, the land theft thing that is colonialism uh, and, and World War I and Spanish-American War and politics and corruption and trust busting and the invention of the automobile and the warming of the planet and the industrial society and communism, the rise of it, communism, the fall of it, Vietnam. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And the whole time, all the posturing, all the noise, all the fear, all the anxiety, all the loss, all the suffering, all the time. What is, that, what is this tree doing? Oh, you know, blessing us. Like re- by receiving from the, from the soil and, and receiving from the sun and doing the magic alchemy that creates the sugar that makes the, the needles multiply and grow and, and then exhaling oxygen for your breath and mine. No matter who's in power. This is, so hints of this glory that is imperishable, incorruptible, are revealed in nature, and, and they're revealed in those moments in our lives when we, when we see, like the veil is pulled away, and we have moments in our lives when we see that this is a world of, like, there's moments in music, there's moments in art, there's moments in story, there's moments of fellowship, intimacy, good food, and hopefully in that moment you go... We're made for this. And what Peter's saying is, this is here now. And so it falls to us then to see glory. Is there suffering? We'll get to that in a minute. Yes. But the starting point isn't suffering. The starting point is, we've got to see the victory in Christ, see the new creation we are in Christ, see the glory and image of God. We want to, that's where we begin. And so let's just talk about one of those things at least. Let's make sure that we're seeing the new creation that each of us are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. And so, so there's something in me that is Christ in me, and that, that Christ in me is perfect. That Christ in me is glorious, even as it is in Eric, even as it is in you, even as it is in Maryland here. There's a Christ in you that delights only in the will of God, that's filled with transcendent beauty and the capacity for, you know, wisdom and generosity and justice and saying the right thing at the right time and shutting up when you should be quiet. Like, that's Christ. And it's, Christ is in you, is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5. You are a new creation. Then, in that same chapter, he says, so I determine now that I'm going to know nobody according to the flesh. And what that means is, I mean, Eric and I are friends, and so Eric's in the front row, right? For those of you who can't see him on the camera. And we're friends, and so we know each other, and I'm sure there's moments when I annoy him, right? Even as there are moments when he annoys me. It's fine. What Paul is saying is our relationship is not defined by his shortcomings or mine. And so what Paul is trying to get us to see, what does Paul say? Therefore, from now on, I regard none of my friends according to the flesh. That's not what he says. I've determined to know no one according to the flesh. Not only my friends, which is a thing, but my enemies, which is a huge thing, right? Don't allow people to be defined by their quirks and shortcomings and pride and shame and politics and posturing and wealth, 
Because he's saying here, there's this glory. That's the starting point. And that binds us together. It's really important. And then he says, not only that, but it's that peace that is imperishable and will never fade away. In contrast to the quirks and our own human bodies. Our own human bodies. Same chapter, 2 Corinthians 5. He says, you know, this beautiful spirit is housed in a tent. And in the tent, we groan because we long to shed the tent. Now, the tent represents really your body and all, the, all your flaws as well. So it's your body and it's your flaws. And the body, is, it, it's destined for the grave. And your flaws are also destined to drop away. And so that's the tent. And so you're in the tent but you don't want to make the tent your identity because it's, fa it's fading away. It's the Christ that isn't fading away. Are you with me? So the tent is fading away. No one, uh, like if, if you're a backpacker and you go down to REI and you buy a new tent, you don't send out a save the date thing and say, hey, there's going to be a tent warming, so come to my house and you know, we're going to have Chardonnay and sit around and celebrate our tent. Nobody does that. Why? Because it's just a tent. It's not brick and mortar and... $10,000 a square foot land is a tent. It's, it's going to be here for like five seasons. And then ultraviolet and dirt and dogs and hypothetically a bear clawing at your tent because you put your food in the tent rather than outside the way you're supposed to. And then you don't have a tent anymore, right? So okay, that's, the tent's gone. Got to, no problem getting a new tent. Here's the thing. Our, in our humanity, we have, we're a tent. So don't worry about it. Like, the truest you is not a tent. It's a mansion. This is the time of year when um, uh, PCT through hikers, I see them every day where I live up at Silicon Pass. We're a mile from the Pacific Coast Trail, and uh, our gas station is also our post office, is also where these hikers mail their food, so we just see them all the time. And then I, I go for a run or a walk uh, with my dog on pieces of the trail. And I saw a guy a week ago, and I knew. You know they're, they're through hikers because you can smell them 10 feet away, 10 yards away probably. And by the time I get here, they, remember, they started Mexican, the border of Mexico. And they're going to Canada. By the time they get here, they've got like 250, 300 miles to go. And uh, they're not all happy campers. Right? So I saw this guy. He's, a, he's coming down the hill to go into town, and I'm heading up. And I see him, and I'm like trying to encourage him. I go, hey, the best part's coming from, you know, so calling past to Stevens Pass. Best part. And he goes, I don't give a, about the best part. <laughs> he says, I just want to be in Canada now. Boom, I'm done. Right? Why did I tell you that story? Because it says in 2 Corinthians 5, we groan in this tent because we're longing for home. Fine, it's good, it's appropriate. Don't, don't get this ego fixation on your tent, which by the way is everything that is kind of you in the flesh. Like don't fixate on your net worth. Don't fixate on your 401k. Don't fixate on your disease. Don't fixate on your body mass index. Don't uh, fixate on your, on, your, on your sex life. Don't fixate on your sphere of influence or on how many followers you have. Don't fixate there. That stuff's all fading away. This thing remains, new life in Christ. But then it's, a, it's appropriate in this world of non-fixation to see the glory of God in this present realm. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from above. And the, pro the biggest problem for many believers, Jesus spoke to it in Matthew, uh, I believe it's 13, where he said, here's, here's the problem, and he's speaking to, like, quote-unquote, seminarians, people with great big Bibles who study them, you know, memorize them, taught them. What does he say? Th these guys who don't get me, they have ears, but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see. So, religious? Yeah. Claim to know God? Yeah. Have a great big Bible? Yeah. Living in the reality of this divine life? In no way. They're missing it entirely. You know, they look super religious. 
So Jesus says then, hey, become a person who sees. Because watch this, when you see, you're empowered to live in both realms, the beauty of eternity and the realities of this present world. You can live in both realms. My favorite author who interprets this is a guy named Rainier Maria Rilke. Uh, he uh, made our standings at the crossroads between time and eternity a central theme of his poetry. For Rilke, humans stand at the crossroad between animals and angels because animals get this life, right? I mean, my dog has it nailed. He's, he can you know, sniff stuff on the trail and is super sensate to this world. And, and then angels have the next life nailed. But Rilke says that only humans are kind of bilingual and can translate this world to the angels and translate uh, the angelic world to, to one another. Only humans can do that. So in one of his poems, there's this old line where somebody says, asking a question, is he local? And here's the answer, no. Both regions stem from his vast nature. That's you and me. Like capacity to uh, see divine light right in the midst of a traffic jam and also see a traffic jam. So, so the, the glory is here and so because your calling is to, is to dwell in that glory, you really need to begin, begin to make seeing a part of your life. For me, that's the price of meditation. There's this thing that I do every morning I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this in a, in, a, in a meditative way. Christ is above me, I receive your gifts. And then I'm trying to consciously think of, you know, what are the gifts you're showing me today, God? And sometimes it's as simple as the very coffee that I just drank. And other times it's my marriage. And other times it's my neighbors. And other times it's my health. And other times it's the food that I had the night before. And it could be, it could be anything. It could be Christ himself. It could be the redemptive story. But I'm like, I want to kind of nurture this habit of gratitude so that in this very broken and dark and warring world, I see myself as living in Narnia, so to speak. Are you with me? Like, yes, saturated with glory. So uh, that book I wrote, Forest Faith, is all about this kind of meditation practice. I really would encourage you to d dwell deep there. Now, the next thing, we got to move on. The, because here's the other deal. The reality is, not only is there glory, but second, the second reality is the trials and the suffering. So we pick that up in verse 6. You greatly rejoice now. Why? It's a glorious world. Even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. And this, if necessary, in the, in the, you know, the Greek language from which we got our Bible, is a conditional necessary. It would be better translated this way. Uh, even though now for a little while, if necessary, and then in parentheses, and it is necessary, you have trials. Because what Peter is saying here is um, there will be suffering, period. Now, uh, why? I mean, you'd think that a life of uninterrupted bliss would be the clearest pathway for seeing the glory of God. But in fact, uh, most of us, if we were just sitting around a campfire and if we had access to everybody's story, this is what we, most of us would be saying. You know what's most transformative? Not all those gifts that I receive with gratitude every day. Those are great. What's most transformative are those moments, boom, you know, when I'm shaken by loss. That's, that's what changed me. Because it says in Hebrews 12 that, you know, our God is a quote-unquote consuming fire. God shakes us in order that the things that cannot be shaken would remain, but the subtext is then the things that can be shaken will what? They'll shake right off the table. And since you live in earthquake country, I don't have to tell you stories, you know them, right? Things like the, when it shakes, stuff falls. And the stuff that's well anchored doesn't fall. So, so uh, here's the thing. We gotta start with this reality. There's gonna be suffering. So we wanna be free from the lie that immunity from suffering is available in exchange for, you know, obedience to God. Remember John 9, uh, th this encounter uh, Jesus has with a blind man? He's born blind. So the disciples want to know, hey, who sinned? Did he sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? Jesus goes, wrong question. 
The question is, how is God going to be glorified in this moment? And there is a way for God to be glorified through trials. So we want to deal with that. And we also want to kind of deal with the Gnostic version of a suffering-free life, which says this, the material world isn't really real, so all suffering's an illusion. My friend, uh, who's a Christian scientist, believed that all suffering is a fabrication of the mind, and therefore, because she was living in that reality, the, the, she would never encounter suffering. And then her neighbor, uh, when she was 12 years old, her healthy neighbor got kidney disease, died very suddenly, and she, her world fell apart. Because I thought that like, the spiritual realm was the only realm. And now the reality of suffering breaks through. Suffering's real. Here's the thing. We're not granted immunity from suffering. Here's what we're granted. Two things. In the midst of suffering, the presence of God. In the midst of suffering, transformation. Those two things. So when, you know, when you, here's the presence of God. When you walk through the fire, I'll be with you. This Christian scientist woman, at, 12, at the age of 12, she says, so I met the real God, when in the midst of my grief and questions, I went outside, it was a dark night, moonless, I saw the Milky Way, and she said, I heard God speak. I heard God speak to me. Like, this is not intellectual, this is uh, a deeper reality than your mind, but she, she heard God. Yes, he died. Yes, I'm with him. Yes, I'm with you. Yes, I will be with you. And yes, all will be well. For you, for him, for all. Boom. That's incredible to me. So we have this presence that walks with us, that comforts us, and then it says that uh, we receive as the outcome of our faith, verse 9, the salvation of our souls. So we're transformed. Now what does that mean? Well, very briefly, your soul is this um, repository where you stash your life story. That's the best way I can say it. In other words, every wound abuse, betrayal, rejection, and lie uh, creates in you defense mechanisms and ways of self-medicating, like when we're hurt, we respond. Also, you know, every success, every word of flattery, every praise can also create in you a sense of pride, right? And then what that does, the pain and the success creates in you like this pattern of attachment and aversion. Oh, when I preach, I get perks. I want to preach forever. Oh, when I meet with Sally, she always has bad things to say. I'm going to go to the other side of the room. That's a version of attachment, right? So, and we all have it. We all have it. And what Peter is saying is when I shake you, that shaking will, in, will, will empower you to heal from all that stuff that leads to shame and and disengagement and fear and self-medicating, and all, it'll, I'm also going to shake your success so it doesn't mean as much anymore. So now you're free from both uh, attachment and aversion, and you're free to do my will. That's, that's, salvation here isn't go to heaven. It means delivered from. Delivered from what? Oh, you know, shame, fear, pride, addiction, self-medicating behavior, all that stuff. How are you delivered? Trials. <laughs> because they reveal the unhealthy stuff and then we, we deal with it. How do we deal with it? That's Eric next week or whoever. I don't know. Somebody's talking about it. But for now, I want to close with this. Two realities. There's two worlds. World of suffering, world of glory. And here's the truth. One of these realities is going to become your primary reality. And you, it, need, it better be the heavenly reality, otherwise you're headed for a life of pain and misery. So verse 13, how do we do that? Gir, prepare your minds for action and fix your hope completely on grace brought to you at the revelation of Christ. So uh, fix your hope completely on Christ. In other words, watch this, your hope is not your circumstances, health, success, wealth, Job, influence, body mass index, status of your marriage, whether Republicans or Democrats win, not your hope. Good news, you have a better hope, rock solid. Your hope, fix your hope completely on what? The, the revelation found in Christ. So 
we, we, we fix our hope there because if we learn anything from the Bible and human history, we learn this. No other hope lasts. Everything's fleeting, right? We're married, but not forever. We, we have money, and we may buy stuff, but when you die, or, or Bill Gates dies, or Jeff Bezos dies, or the person living at Green Lake dies, everybody goes to the grave with the same amount, and it's this much, zero. So don't fix your hope there. So, fix your hope on the revelation found in Christ. And then finally, chapter 2, verse 1, put aside hypocrisy, envy, all that stuff, because your hope isn't in this, in this world. Instead, long for the pure milk of the word, which means this, not the Bible as a code to kind of uh, fortify your ego so you can beat people up with apologetics arguments, but fix your hope on the word that it, it says here, Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. Like, allow the word to be transformative so that you can live in this beautiful heavenly reality. And watch this. Allow the heavenly reality to become your kind of myopic fixation that doesn't turn you into Pollyanna. It informs how you deal with pain and loss. That's the thing that this text is saying. In other words, we're so afraid, I think, especially sometimes in, in, in a reactionary response to sugary sweet evangelicalism, we're like this. We got to be off. We got to be authentic. We got to be honest, and then we wear our feelings on our sleeve. And what happens is we become known as kind of, you know, bitter, anxious, angry people. Why? Because in the name of authenticity, we're now myopically fixated on our injustices. Can I just say, no, <laughs> don't do that. That will not only harm the testimony of Christ, that will destroy you. Fix your hope completely. And completely means 99%. Oh, wait, no. 100%. Your hope is not on fixing stuff. Your hope is on the revelation of Christ. And then you're able to live as a person of hope in the midst of your own losses and in the midst of a suffering world. How do I know? Well, Ravensbrück was a death camp in Germany. And at the end of World War II, it was liberated by the Allies. And one of the Allies found this note on the body of a dead child. Listen, listen to this. Here's someone whose hope is fixated on eternity. Oh, Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill who died here, but also those of ill will. But do not remember, I pray, all the suffering they inflicted on us. <laughs> Rather, remember the fruits we have bought thanks to the suffering they inflicted on us. For now we have known comradeship, loyalty, humility, courage, generosity, greatness of heart, all of which have grown out of this suffering. And when they who inflicted suffering on us come to judgment... May all the fruits which we have borne be their forgiveness. Who does that? People fixated on hope. May that be our story in Christ. Father, uh, we're mindful that the reputation of Christianity is not so good right now in our culture. That we're known as defensive and argumentative and petty and judgmental. And as we commit uh, uh, this series to you, more significantly, we want to commit our lives to you and invite you to shape us as people of hope right in the midst of all that will unfold when we leave here. Traffic, oncology, therapists, classrooms, board meetings, marriages, man, it's hard, <laughs> but we have a hope, imperishable, undefiled, which will never fade away. Give us eyes to see and hearts to live. We pray in Christ's name, amen.